Hello, and uh, welcome back to the course. So we're going to look at the residue theorem again. Um, this time we're going to look at some applications. So last time we proved it, so this time we're going to use it. Uh, so this is uh, part two of section 5.3 in the book. All right, so <clears throat> recall what the uh, residue term says, right? So it says that if I have a a domain U, uh, and there's a finite set S in U, um, and we have a holomorphic function with uh, isolated singularities at S, and we have a cycle gamma that is that doesn't go through the singularities, uh, but it's homologous to zero in U, right? So not necessarily in U minus S, because, well, then, then the integral just be zero, but in U. Right, so it doesn't wind around anything in the complement of U, right? But it can wind around the, those singularities, and actually, it should for this to be useful. And then, then what we get is that the integral of f around this gamma, always well, that factor one over two pi i, um, is basically the sum of the residues uh, multiplied by. Uh, the you know how many times we wind around um, each uh, singularity, so multiplied by the winding number of gamma around these singularities, right? And again, just to recall the the residue. What is the residue? The residue is the c minus one coefficient, so the negative first coefficient in the Laurent series when you expand it at p, right, uh, of f, right? So that's the that's what the residue is. Now, c minus one has a formula in terms of an integral, right? I mean, it's you know when we uh, figured out what was the Laurent series, right? We wrote down a formula for c minus one. Actually, we, that's what we used last time in the proof. Uh, <clears throat> so it has a, you know, uh, how do you compute it? Well, you compute an integral, right? So it seems a little uh, strange that uh, if the residue term is supposed to be useful for computing integrals that it takes an integral and replaces it with a bunch of integrals, right? That seems not as useful, right? Um, but really, the you know, the idea is that we have lots of different tricks uh, to compute um, the residue, right? Uh, we don't necessarily have to compute those integrals. Those integrals, you know, might be easier. They, you know, they're only going around sort of, you know, a circle centered at the, uh, you know, um, at the singularity, but we don't even have to compute uh, integrals a lot of times. So we'll go over a couple of these tricks. I mean, the most common, uh, most common tricks. So the first one, uh, let's actually prove this one. Um, it's uh, basically that I can add or subtract uh, holomorphic uh, bits, right? So, which makes sense because it's it's the um, uh, it's the Laurent series. If I, you know, add or subtract the power series, I'm not uh, changing the minus first uh, cord uh, uh, coefficient, right? So if I have uh, a function g with an isolated singularity uh, and I add um, a holomorphic function or subtract the holomorphic function f from it, the residue doesn't change, right? So let's let's look at the proof of this proposition, right? So we write down what the residue is in terms of an integral, right? And uh, you know we split the integral into two bits, the f bit and the g bit, and the f bit is just zero because well. It's a holomorphic function. Um, it's actually holomorphic, uh, you know, a whole neighborhood of this of this disk, right? Uh, so just by Cauchy's theorem, right? It's not going around any uh, singularity. So that um, that integral is zero by Cauchy's theorem. So therefore, the you know, it's just the second integral, which is the residue of G, right? So. That's the proof. So a couple of propositions we won't prove, but they're also really simple to prove. Uh, so here, if we have um, uh, you, you know a simple pole, 
we actually have a very, very simple formula, or this is one of the formulas of, for a simple poll. And basically what you do uh, is you multiply by Z minus P and you take limit. I mean, generally the, the, the way this works is that you have some, um, uh, you know, some way of expressing F of Z times Z minus P. Uh, you can sort of cancel things and then just uh, evaluate, right? Uh, so that's uh, that's one expression for the, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the residue. If we have a pole of higher order, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, if we have a uh, say pole of order k, then yeah, you have to uh, you know you have to compute this uh, somewhat more complicated formula, right? So probably want to wouldn't really want to do it if it was a uh, really high order. Well, but it's it works, right? Uh, so and again, the you know really the idea is is that if you can if you can compute the uh, uh, the you know if if you can simplify this expression, uh, then then this becomes useful. All right, <clears throat> and the proof is an exercise. <clears throat> so now I said there was another actually this was probably my favorite way of computing. Uh, the the residue um, at a simple pole. Um, so if you write down your um, your function um, as a you know, numerator over denominator, and the denominator has a simple zero, uh, so this and, and the numerator does not have a zero, right? Um, I mean, if it if it does have a zero, then you're just gonna get zero, right? Uh, but uh, if it's uh, uh, you know, so if it if it does have a simple pole, then the numerator is not going to have, um, it's not going to be zero at p. Um, so, but uh, g has a simple zero, so g prime at p is non-zero, and then we just evaluate. Uh, you know, the we take the numerator at p divided by g prime at p, and and that's what it is, right? And again, we'll just leave this as exercise. A lot of the polls that that come up in applications are actually simple. So, so this is uh, you know, it's useful to know how to do it for the simple ones. All right. So let's do an exercise uh, example. Uh, think of it as an exercise. Um, so let's look at this this integral. And I know we we can compute it in other ways. Uh, you know. We know what the you know antiderivative uh, of uh, one over one plus x squared is, right? It's just the arctangent. But let's suppose that we didn't know that. The reason why I want to do this is because it is a uh, you know it's sort of the the you know one of the simpler um, examples uh, where we can apply uh, residue theorem. But you could do it in much more complicated um, examples. But then you know. It, it would be sort of more computation. So we're, you know, for simplicity's sake, let's just suppose that we didn't know how to do this, right? That we didn't know how to compute this integral, right? And we want to uh, apply um, residue term to do it. So, yeah. All right, so how do we, how do, we do this? Well, let's, Define this. So this is going to be the gamma that we're gonna uh, that we're gonna use, right? It's gonna be it's gonna go from minus r to r, and we're really trying to integrate over the entire real line. So we're gonna let r go to infinity, right? So really, this part of the integral that's the one that we're interested in, uh, letting r go to infinity, right? Well, we need a cycle. So in this case, let's just you know go back uh, like this through um, a semicircle, right? Of radius r as well, right? So that's going to be r gamma, right? For each r, there is a different gamma r, of course, right? So now we complexify what's inside, and by complexify, 
just mean that we're going to start plugging in complex numbers, right? So 1 over 1 plus x squared um, becomes 1 over 1 plus z squared. And we're just plugging in complex numbers. So we get this 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 nice rational function, uh, you know, it's it's uh, uh, you know it's holomorphic except where the uh, <coughs> denominator vanishes and it vanishes at two points. It vanishes at minus i and i, right? I mean we can we can factor the uh, the denominator like this. Uh, we could use uh, you know, we we could apply partial fractions. So if you compute partial fractions, it looks like this, right? <coughs> So these are both simple poles, right? Both of these singularities are simple poles. And you notice that uh, gamma winds around once around i, and it doesn't wind around minus i at all. All right, so let's compute uh, the residue. And <clears throat> I'll do it in two different ways, but it's um, it doesn't really matter how you compute it. It's actually very simple in this case, right? So the first... Let's use the first proposition that, that we did, right? I mean, if, if you look at it, I'm looking at the residue at i, right? So uh, so I'm, you know, this this guy, yeah, that does have um, um, an isolated singularity at i, but this other guy does not, right? So it's holomorphic at i, so I can just subtract it, right? And so the residue of, of this guy, 1 over 1 plus z squared, is the same as the residue of this guy, right? And that's that's definitely a, a, a simpler one to do, right? And uh, I could do, you know, I could multiply by, you know, now z minus i, and, uh, you know, I immediately get, <laughs> right, um, get, uh, you know, just minus i over 2, right? Or maybe I could um, I could differentiate the bottom that's also uh, really simple, right? You know, same same thing, right? I get uh, minus i over two, or you could uh, you could just do it directly without using the first trick, right? I mean, you could you could just uh, um, you know we're trying to do this, so multiply by z minus i, and then and then try to uh, you know. Uh, well, we have to simplify this to take the limit, right? So we we uh, we uh, cancel this guy out of there, right? We'd, uh, then we plug in uh, plug in an i, right? So that's why we're getting the two i. It's the same thing, right? We end up with the, I mean, we better end up with the same thing, right? It's the residue is well defined, right? No matter how you get it, you should get the same thing. All right, so now let's apply the residue theorem. So, uh, right. So we get uh, this. This is what the residue theorem tells us, right? Oh, sorry. This is this is not what the residue theorem tells us yet. Uh, this is this is what we just computed. <laughs> sorry about that. The next equality is what the residue theorem tells us, right? So the residue, right, you know, all I did was multiply by two pi i, right? Uh, but this equality is what the residue theorem tells us, right? It tells us that whatever this thing is. That's this integral, right? So that integral is pi by the residue term, right? So if we integrate around this, we get pi. And it doesn't really matter what r was. All right, so now that's not the integral we're interested in. We're really interested in this guy, right? But uh, we don't quite get it yet immediately, right? I mean, the integral around gamma r, right? I mean, it's the integral around the thing that we're interested in, and then this little gamma r, right? This this the thing that goes back, right? So we have to get this integral as well. All right, <clears throat> so so that's what we have so far, right? Is that pi is equal to the sum of these integrals, right? And we really wanted to, you know, we really want to compute this one at least as r goes to infinity, right? That's that's really. I mean, we don't really care about what it is for some finite r. We care about what it is for r equals infinity, right? Let's assume that r is bigger than one, just for simplicity. Uh, and uh, the length of this guy is r n, right? I mean, 
the length grows, right? We're integrating over a bigger and bigger, uh, you know, arc, right? Longer and longer arc. However, the, you know, what's inside is actually going to zero faster than that. And that's the point. We're actually going to show that this second integral actually goes to zero, right? So to do that, well, uh, let's look at how, how large the inside is. And so, uh, you know, if I want to bound one over one plus z squared, I bound one plus z squared from below. So um, it's, uh, you know, inverse um, triangle inequality. Um, and this is where I'm using that r is bigger than one. Uh, so we have um, we have this uh, you know this uh, uh, this inequality, and I can take one over that and get uh, you know get uh, a bound, right? So so then I have then I bound this integral, right? The absolute you know the modulus of it by well it's just by the length of the integral right and uh, a bound an upper bound on what's inside all right and as r goes to infinity right because the you know this guy grows as um, as r squared right uh but the numerator grows as r so this goes to zero so therefore this guy if i take r goes to infinity right is equal to pi, right? Because this this part of it goes to zero, right? Now there's a one slight technicality. Uh, why was why was it sufficient to take the symmetric limit, right? I mean, you know, this integral is really taking both limits separately, right? Um, in this case, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I'll I'll let you think about why it doesn't matter. It's, it's for a very simple reason, right? Um, but it doesn't. So it's it it will work like this, right? Uh, so so that's that's how you know that's that's you know one of the simplest uh, applications of uh, you know of of residue theorem. Um, you know that that's and it's very sort of emblematic of how uh, you know how the uh, residue theorem is applied to computer integrals, right? It's this sort of procedure. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is to sort of pick the gamma correctly. And that's sort of the, that's the tricky bit. You have to figure out what is the function, you know, what are you trying to compute, how you're going to pick the gamma, what sort of limit you're taking, right? And generally you want uh, the, you know, whatever you add to make it a cycle, uh, you know, you want to make sure that it goes to zero or to something something known, right? So, um, so this was this was just the simplest simplest example of of the use, right? Now sometimes we're not adding you know something to make a cycle. We might recognize uh, you know an integral as actually being a path integral, even though it might not really look like it. So, for example. If we, uh, if we're integrating trigonometric functions, uh, you know, over zero to two pi or something, uh, then we might actually just be looking at uh, an integral over the unit circle, just written out, uh, you know, in a different way, right? So on the unit circle, we have that z bar is one over z, right? So, you know, if, if, if we're going over the unit circle, so z is e to the i theta, right? Then cosine, the real part of e to the i theta, right? Well, we could just write it as this, z plus z bar, which is one over z divided by two. And sine, similarly, we have this formula, right? It's just the imaginary part of, um, of z, All right? So let's do an example. So Suppose that we're doing an integral from zero to two pi of uh, one over c plus cosine theta, and let's just assume that uh, c is bigger than one, so we're not dividing by zero. <clears throat> All right, so let's let's do the substitution. Uh, you know, uh, well, so let's you know go to the z's. You know, think about it as a you know what sort of path integral it would be. So we're going around the unit circle. And uh, so 
right? Uh, the, the boundary of the unit disk. We replaced the, uh, the uh, you know, cosine uh, theta with, uh, uh, you know, was, was, was this guy, right? And we replaced the d theta by what it should be, right? Uh, you know, in terms of dz, right? So if I do the dz substitution, right, normally I'd have to it's sort of i e to the i theta, but that that gets, uh, you know, that would get killed if I do 1 over i z, right? Because z is e to the i theta, right? Okay, so now I have this uh, this integral over a cycle uh, in, you know, in the complex plane. Uh, you know, and this guy has, um, well, he's going to have some, uh, you know, some... Um, uh, some poles, right? I mean, it's it's this uh, you know rational function. Let me this this rational function over here, right? It might be good to to simplify it a little bit. So if you if you do a little bit of algebra, right, uh, you find out well I can pull out a minus two i, so I don't care about that. And then I have uh, this guy over here. Uh, so this quadratic guy in the denominator this is going to have two poles, right? Because that's going to have two zeros, right? Uh, <clears throat> what are the two poles? Well, just you, know, you just compute just by the, by the quadratic formula gives you gives you this guy. One of these is going to be inside the unit circle. One of these is going to be outside the unit circle. So it's uh, you know here remember that that c is bigger than one. Right, uh, so so you only think about the one that's inside the unit circle, which is going to be, um, you know, that's that, that's going to be this one, right? The the one with the with the plus, right? Because the one with the minus, you know, you're you have already minus c, which is already outside the unit circle, and if you subtract something positive. You know, you're gonna be end up even further outside the unit circle. So it's the the one that's inside the unit circle is the other one. We have minus c, and then you add something that's that's actually sort of uh, you know this this is you know especially for large c, this is almost like c, right? It's slightly smaller than c. Anyway, doesn't matter. But that guy is uh, you know the, the, this whole thing is inside the unit circle. So if we're going around by the residue term, right? So this is where we're applying the residue term, right? So we apply this to, you know, to this thing, right? So that's why I have the minus 2i and then, you know, this part is the residue term, right? And now I just, uh, you know, um, you know, compute the residue. So here, again, you know, it has two poles. There are different poles, uh, so they're both simple. Uh, so probably the easiest way to uh, compute the um, the residue would be to well differentiate the the bottom and plug in the you know the point, right? However you compute the residue, it's not hard, um, and you get uh, you get this. Uh, you know, this result, right? So, you know, we start with something that doesn't quite look uh, like something, you know, in complex analysis, and we just write it as something uh, that is uh, integral over a cycle, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the idea. Now, another common application, and we're not going to do this, I'm going to just leave it as an exercise. It's more like the first, uh, first guy that we did is actually to compute uh, Lapla you know inverse Laplace transform. So there's a there's a, uh, a formula called the Mellin's inversion formula. So if you know about Laplace transform, if you don't know about Laplace transform, this is not interesting. <laughs> if you know about Laplace transform, right? Uh, a lot of times the way you know the way you see it in you know undergraduate uh, differential equations, right? Uh, you're usually doing this through a table, right? You look at a table uh, of, of of known transforms and try to, you know, massage everything so that it fits something in your table, and then you sort of read off what the answer is. But you could also use this this formula, um, and you know, it's if you don't have a big enough table to to have what you need, uh, maybe this will work, right? Um, so if you have 
uh, this 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 transform uh, f of s, um, and it has to be sort of defined. You, you have to be able to complexify this 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 guy. Uh, so, like if it's rational, for example, and uh, so if uh, if you have this this uh, capital F, which is the Laplace transform of some f of t, right? And I want to get f of t back. So the inversion formula says, right? So this is the inverse Laplace transform, but it just says it's this thing, right? So it's the uh, it's the integral over a vertical line in the complex plane, right? So you know c is some fixed uh, fixed constant, and we're going from minus i r to uh, well, c minus i r. Think of let's say c is as zero for simplicity. So now we're going from minus i r to plus i r, right? So in a we're going in a vertical line, right? And uh, wow, well, that's what it is, right? Right. So it's here again. We don't have a cycle. We have to make it a cycle, but it's very similar to what we did before. Now, the way that uh, uh, you know you do it, you basically you have, you have to add something that goes around the poles, right? So, as an exercise, try computing a few. Like, let's suppose that I have this thing or or this thing for more, you know, like you know, having something more complicated, and try computing what the what the inverse Laplace transform is, right? And and pick the right C and then pick the right uh, cycle that will go over, like go around all the poles, right? And then you know, then you're taking the the, the limit as R goes to infinity. That's what that's what you're interested in, right? And that's going to give you the the f of t, right? All right, so. Um, uh, that's it for for now. Uh, so uh, you know, next time we'll look at we'll start looking at counting zeros and poles. Uh, so we're gonna uh, look at the argument principle, and, you know, and then then its friends, uh, you know, Rouchet, Trim, uh, Hurwitz, and, and and others. Uh, so so that's where we're going next time, right? Uh, so all right. So see you then.